Hi hey everybody, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Revamp or Redesign, Navigating the Crossroads of Website Evolution. Um, record. Did. Okay. Yeah, my name is John Cloyes. I'm the Assistant Director of Web and Digital Initiatives here at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, I've been in the Drupal community now for a little bit over 10 years and um, I've been with the school for about seven. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Dick. I'm a solutions architect uh, at Evolving Web. Um, I'm involved, involved a lot in uh, technical analysis and audits of websites. I'm going to talk a little about that shortly. And my name is Alex Dergachev. I'm the co-founder and I would say former technical lead of Evolving Web in the sense that it's been probably five or six years since I've touched code or even logged into a Drupal site. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it is my ninth Drupal camp in New Jersey, so I feel like I've, I've earned some experience. Thank you. So today we have a, you know, a lot to um, discuss and discover. Um, first we'll start out with a little bit of history and background of the SPIA website. Um, then we'll dive a little bit into um, sort of a website audit, how that translates to more of the goals and objectives and a content strategy. And then um, sort of the meat and potatoes of today's conversation is, you know, revamp versus redesign. You know, what's the difference and, and what are the pros and cons of that? Um, then, then I'll discuss sort of where I think we're going and sort of what the, f what the future holds and then wrap up with some key takeaways. So the current SPIA website uh, launched in July of 2020, 2020 directly following a, a school name change. Um, and people often ask me, like, John, did you have any insider knowledge? And no, literally got a phone call. And like basically the next day slash next week, boom, we had a new website. You know, yes, we were working on, on things in the, in the sidelines, but it was literally <laughs> like somebody, you know, flipped the light switch, right? Um, and, and through that process, you know, we really wanted to sort of bring the stories of students and faculty to life, you know, highlight some of our scholarly research, contextualize some of that research and content that we have, and a visual and very engaging and visual way. Um, so through design components and things like that, and um, th through the process, we selected Evolving Web, and they were very instrumental in helping us um, launch the site and also on a, such an aggressive timeline. So before I start with, with any posing question, I, I like to lead with data, right? And so that for me is, you know, taking a look at your website analytics to give you sort of that overarching general pulse of how your site is doing. Um, we can all make assumptions of, you know, yeah, we're an academic institution, we're a school, we have an admissions department. Typically, we see, we see spikes and peaks around uh, admission deadlines. If there's a, a pillar piece of content that's coming out about a faculty appointment, um, we can make those assumptions, but I never like to assume. Um, so I like to really dig into sort of the analytics and some of the top four reports, at least with G4, now is sort of the acquisition overview, path exploration, engagement overview, and landing pages. Um, I won't go into details of that right now, but if you're, if you're new to looking at analytics, I can recommend, um, there's a resource called Analytics Mania uh, that's, that's very good on YouTube, so I recommend you look at that. Um, so once we sort of take that high level overview, cursory look at the analytics, we begin to dial uh, a little bit deeper into sort of an um, audit, so to speak. So I, I um, distill a website audit down to sort of four elements. You know, UX design, technical, more of the content side, SEO, and then accessibility. When I think of a UX design audit, I'm really focusing on sort of the user interaction, right? Who's coming to our site? 
what what pieces of content are they engaging in? How are they getting there? So that touches a little bit on uh, navigation. How all of this, you know, sort of informs that uh, information architecture. And then finally, um, looking at your on-site search experience. Um, again, some of the things that I like to use to, to evaluate those things are analytics, um, user personas, more like uh, prioritizing your audience, user journeys through maps, and then finally, just sort of user feedback via surveys, etc. One of the things I want to highlight is sort of prioritizing your audience. Uh, I like to sort of rate these as primary, secondary, or in some ways not really applicable. Um, and what I mean by that is primary audiences, you know, they're, they're, they're vital to your school's success and their, their primary interaction is with your website. Secondary audiences can maybe interact with a piece of social content and then get directed to your website. And then the, the audience that really don't interact with your organization or represent a priority group such as like students or faculty or pr prospective students, etc. This is an example of just sort of a grad student journey map. Um, you know, I'm, I like old school stuff, so like, you know, post-it notes, a wall, does just fine. Um. Okay, great. And in terms of more of a, of a technical audit, um, we look at a whole bunch of different areas, including the overall uh, architecture of a website, and that's gonna include some things like uh, the coding standards, uh, what kind of modules or extensions are installed? Spe specifically, when we're looking at contribs, are they still supported? Uh, are they being managed by the security team so we can have some, some confidence there that they're going to be, be secure in the future? Uh, we're also looking at things like the integrations that are in place. I'll cover that a little bit more. Uh, the, also, any sort of critical issues that might be, uh, that need urgent, urgent attention and remediation. But also maybe the, just a the general uh, overall quality of the architecture approach of, of, a, of a site. In terms of security and performance, there's a lot to look at. Again, the, uh, the coding standards are going to be a big part of that, but also the hosting is going to be a huge player in that as well. Um, we like to know if the current solution is working, if there's any gaps there. Uh, is it a cloud-based solution that's going to scale well and perform well? Um, or is there any, any caching layers maybe that we need to, to consider to, to add to that? We're also looking at, at <coughs> excuse me, at uh, single sign-on. Do we have some some ways to uh, add some uh, some additional security with some additional integrations there? Uh, and again, like I said, the overall code quality is important to uh, to the security of, of any website. Uh, in terms of the the functionality, um, you know, looking at what what we have in place today, what modules are filling that? What would we potentially need to augment, or or even what do we need to add? Going back to that, maybe that SSO, if there's a an opportunity to add that in, that's going to help in many different areas, including just a easier uh, 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 login for everybody. And other integrations that we're looking at, maybe we have some other internal systems that need to be pulled in or that are being pulled in. Try to map those out, figure out what's there, what, what content is pulling in, how it's working in general. Um, also, maybe some search functionalities. You know, it's common to use a, a search provider like a solar uh, type of system. We want to figure out what, what those integrations are there as well. And then just considering maybe what, what might be the roadmap, what's coming up in the future, how do we, what do we need to do there. And there's a whole bunch of tools that we use for this, uh, including the entire Google suite, uh, like John mentioned, analytics, and, and, and a lot of other uh, tools there, like Search Console. Um, the hosting providers themselves, the partners, uh, New Relic data, and just like regular uh, updates. We also really like to use something called uh, Screaming Frog that we'll cover in a moment as well. Um, our general methodology is kind of to do a bunch of sort of workshops or like meetings with, with the teams that are, that are managing the site today, figuring out what's in there, what, what they're managing, what the infrastructure looks like. Uh, the code analysis, again, looking at uh, the custom code and modules that we might have, uh, the analysis of the general code for best practices, all that kind of things. There's various tools that we can use in the PHP world to really, to really help out with that. Uh, configuration analysis, again, just figuring out how it's set up, if there's multiple environments, uh, and then how that actual, how that deployment process looks like. Is it a kind of like an industry standard practice, or is there something a little less uh, best practice that we can, can recommend some solutions on? And that's in addition to all the things that I, that I mentioned previously. So I mentioned Screaming Frog, and this is just a quick snapshot of, uh, of a results of a, of a scan of a whole website. Um, it gives us, you know, finds all the content that maybe we didn't even know exists there yet. 
uh, just through, through crawling it all. And this is a pretty overwhelming spreadsheet, uh, but what we typically end up doing is trying to segment it and build some various uh, pivot tables and, and seeing what data we can kind of extract from but maybe you know we start to see some some structure under the hood and realize that we need to start redefining the overall uh, uh, content uh, structure and 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 maybe there's some some new functionality that's needed to help fill some of those gaps or, or something that we didn't even know was there yet. So just diving into all that data, diving in pretty deep and and doing various different ways of of, of, uh, of analyzing it, different pivot tables and and whatnot. And while we're doing that, we're also looking at the, the overall structure. We tend to build something that we call a data transfer table that just outlines and documents the whole structure of the, of the, of the content type, including all the, the nodes, the views, basically everything, blocks, everything that we can. And we get into that, again, documenting it all, but really just looking for what, what else is, is in there that we should actually analyze a little bit deeper after that. So once you've really done uh, this sort of technical audit, you can um, start to prioritize some following uh, features and functionalities of the website. You know, is it a registration? Is it alert banner? Password protected areas like an intranet? You know, etc. Um, following that, you can um, really sort of um, dig down to sort of the content of your of your website, and um, when you're when you're doing that, like when you're sort of close to your brand, uh, I encourage people to go sort of big and bold, right, with their colors. Um, but then when you have a lot of content, how do you group that content so it's easily digestible and sort of in the content collections, if you will? Um, then this starts to um, create sort of content relevance or alignment, if you will. Um, also, how does this affect your on-page and off-page SEO? Um, again, I'll reference uh, the Screaming Frog tool as a, as a great SEO tool, Google Search Console, uh, and finally a hot jar uh, for some uh, testing as well. Uh, last but certainly not least to our audit website audit process is sort of an accessibility audit. Um, and I know WCAG 2.1 uh, was the um, industry standard for a while. It's just recently moved to 2.2 AA. Um, I would encourage everyone to you know, do automated testing as well as manual testing. Automated testing covers maybe 25% of the areas of the errors. Um, additionally, with, with higher ed sites, a lot of times uh, we have a lot of PDFs. So uh, take, a, take, a, take a look at those. <laughs> um, I hear some chuckles in the room. Um, what we use here at Princeton, we use our DubBot. Uh, to do sort of automatic uh, crawling of the websites. Um, there's also uh, Site Improve as well. Um, I like uh, Accessibility Insights, which is a nice uh, Chrome uh, extension uh, made by Microsoft. And then finally, just there's the tools that you have, like VoiceOver on your Mac or your phone, and something as simple as the tab key, right? <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> so. So once you uh, complete um, sort of that website audit, how do you sort of translate those into goals and objectives? Um, and through this process, and let me back up, a lot of times a, a question I get is, you know, how often should I do a website audit, right? Um, and I like to tell people early and often, right? I understand like if, if resources are limited, but you know, really every six months, definitely uh, yearly uh, would be great, um, but Anyway, so how do you turn those findings into sort of these goals and objectives? So quick example here is sort of building that brand awareness, right? How do you establish your website as credible, authoritative source within your industry um, and get the recognition and visibility that it deserves? Um, through this at SPIA, we've launched uh, several uh, initiatives over the past year. Um, the SPIA in New Jersey, which is, um, was founded to produce and promote innovative policy statewide. Um, we opened an office uh, in DC uh, to connect our students and faculty and our research centers directly with policymakers on Capitol Hill. And last but not least, uh, we have the Afghan Policy Lab that brings in academic fellows from Afghanistan 
to collaborate with Princeton University faculty and provide policy recommendations related to Afghanistan. And now I want to show um, one of the things that we, we found um, that's not too surprising is that video drives a lot of traffic to our website. It's a lot of engagement. Um, and it has been a really, really good source for us. Um, so I'm going to play um, sort of this anthem video that we did uh, for SPIA in DC. The world is facing many, many different challenges. Whether it's climate change or nuclear weapons or the issue of poverty or public health, stakes are very high. At Princeton, with the School of Public International Affairs, we're actively mobilizing and addressing these worldwide problems in really awe-inspiring ways. It's a rush to be here. We have some of the best economists, political scientists, social psychologists, historians in the world devoting themselves to the policy solutions based on science. I'm trying to understand why people get HIV and how to prevent it. In the U.S., it's a story really of racial health inequality. To me, the main discussion these days is how do we make sure that our democratic system continues to move forward, finding middle ground for common good. We are creating a virtual reality experience to deepen the imagination of ordinary people about what it is to go through a nuclear crisis. As a psychologist, I think being in a policy school makes me bolder. I can study how to keep people healthier, how to prevent conflict. I want the world to be more equal, and I think that solving a problem like climate change is consistent with that. Most of my students want to save the world. That's what they want to do. We train doers. They're interested in knowing what works. Students will team up with professors to take on war, security, immigration, political polarization, economic inequalities. But we don't want to be the ivory tower sitting yonder. That's why we're going to Washington, D.C. This foothold will allow us to bring in influential policymakers, to bring in our alumni, taking what we're already doing to the next level. At this school, if you want to be part of changing the world, you can do it. It's hard not to be hopeful. The next generation will imagine changing things that we could not have imagined, as we have imagined change that our grandparents could not have imagined. You know, as Margaret Mead said, never believe that a small group of individuals can't make a difference, but indeed that is all that ever has. So with that, you know, again, we were able to sort of really use that as a springboard um, to sort of establish um, a, 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 foot, a footing in D.C. That the, that the school hasn't had, but also the university. Um, uh, another example um, is sort of expanding your reach or your audience. Um, and one of the dean's priorities is internationalization um, and Last fall, before our admissions season, uh, we had the opportunity to um, partner with the Washington Post on a geo-targeting uh, uh, ad campaign. Um, also, we work a lot with foreign affairs um, and, and place ads in there as well. Um, that's just some of the paid, paid ways that we can do it. Um, yeah. Uh, again, you know, it's it's about this is all about sort of improving the user experience, um, enhancing the website's usability, accessibility, uh, to keep visitors engaged um, and encourage them for return visits. Uh, we do a series here called um, Policy Profiles, um, and it highlights students that are currently here at the school, um, and 
whenever we talk to students and prospective students and even uh, families, that's one of the things that comes up over and over again is, you know, people are looking for, for someone like them, right? Um, and so one of the ways we were able to do that is um, through these uh, student spotlights. Um, so here's a little screenshot here, but I was going to have him play this as well. I think uh, those who, who get to attend, meeting the staff and admissions and really understanding that what took place behind the scenes in order for myself to have been selected and realizing that I wasn't just a number, that I actually was a person that people were able to get to know through my application and wanted to further get to know. People are already having conversations about how uh, we can contribute to the community of SPIA well after we graduate. So uh, what distinguishes SPIA from other programs is, is certainly the value that it places in those that study here and the community that it builds uh, and lifelong relationships. So we've done sort of a website audit. We've defined some goals and objectives. Um, and then I like to turn to uh, sort of a, a content strategy approach, right? I'm a, um, and this is one of the ways you can build various templates that help you define topics, formats, and sort of what messages are conveyed. Um, again, linking back to your audit findings, those goals and objectives, etc. This can help you um, define more of the content structure. Here's a, um, a research brief uh, that we did, and it's your basic hero, intro, author, topics, taxonomy, source, etc. Um, one thing we always like to do is, is sort of What's that relevant brand expression? You know, and if you take your brand that's over here and your audience, and they come together, you know, sort of what makes you different, um, and what does the audience care about? And you know, how will we measure that success? So when we go back and do an additional audit, how do we know that we've, you know, made progress? Whether that's time on site, responsive rate, click through rate. So, um, the big part of today's presentation, revamp versus redesign, you know, and what's the difference? So when I talk about a revamp, I mean, you're refining your design, you're adding components to your component library, you're using content collections to update your content, you're enhancing functionality and user experience through your audits and the goals and objectives that you defined before. Um, redesign, you start to see more of <clears throat> branding changes, um, messaging, positioning, um, even some technological advancements, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, maybe some uh, changing in leadership, goals and priorities, um, and you want to may remain relevant. You want to have that competitive edge. So when to consider a revamp? You know, if you look at your site and your content seems a little stale, outdated. Search results are no longer relevant. Um, functionality <coughs> is, is, is frail. And um, your designs seem a little limited or flat. Um, also, I mean, a, a huge one is maybe some budget or resource constraints. Um, so through the years, um, I guess it's been about four years now, I've lost all track of time <laughs> since the pandemic, but um, we've implemented some of these things to sort of enhance and, and meet those needs through uh, popular search terms, facets. Um, I mentioned content collections. So here we sort of have our news at SPIA. Um, we have a little bit of a timeline feature here to the right um, that we're using more for content. And then your typical stats and facts at the bottom. We've uh, tried to embrace sort of this media rich first experience um, through uh, ambient video, which uh, features 
some of our uh, community, uh, Dean's leadership speakers. Um, the sort of this carousel at the bottom. Um, and then uh, topical based research and imagery around that. Again, some more uh, image card collections here at the top. A um, info card at the bottom. Um, recently did a Spear Reacts piece on crisis in the Middle East. And, and how do we sort of group that there? And then finally, here to the right, um, more of those policy profile quotes. Um, <clears throat> moving along to uh, the power of a redesign. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, you can just really embrace uh, a new brand or creative direction. Um, <clears throat> really start to consider those um, bigger technical advancements, which we'll touch on in a minute. And, and start to show alignment to those strategic priorities that maybe have changed because of a change in leadership or your staff. Um, recently, the, the Princeton University um, partnered with a branding and research firm, and um, here's some of the findings and examples out of that. You'll see a lockup at the bottom, some masking uh, patterns, etc. there. Um, one big thing, uh, advancement that's happened in the last four years is uh, Layout Builder. Um, and so this sort of gives you that no code, drag and drop experience. Um, it helps people like myself that are w more communications oriented and help uh, content marketers um, have that drag and drop experience. Um, Speaking of, of content authors, you know, sort of that refined workflow, what does the administrative theme look like on the back end? Um, this is an example of a gen theme in, in Drupal. So, so to bring back uh, the conversation to the original subject, which is, are you doing a revamp or a redesign? Like, what, what's, uh, what's the right thing? So when, when John mentioned to me that he was doing this talk, I got, I got very excited. Um, for mainly because I have, a, I, have a, I have a message for the Drupal community. As a, as a Drupalist for 16 years running an agency, uh, in the last couple of years especially, we, we have lots of Drupal sites that need to be upgraded. And people are saying, hey, I have a Drupal 7 site. It's complex. It's got... 10 or 50,000 pages, and, and we just want to leave it alone. And so can we just do a lift and shift from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 or Drupal 10? And, um, and so I hear it all the time. And I, and I said, I have to be on this stage to talk about that for a second, because it's a pet peeve of mine. And, um, and I have, before I give you my, my conclusions, I just want to share three, three interesting data points. Our first project uh, from Princeton University was with uh, Princeton University Press who, as far as I know, has not had a name change anytime recently. <laughs> Hopefully will not for a long time. And uh, they, they had a VB script, uh, a set of VB scripts that gener generated a static, uh, static set of pages with, I think, 10,000 to 100,000 pages, and uh, I think it was like 9,000 books, if my five-year-old memory serves correctly. Who knows? Uh, but it was, it was a, lot of, uh, a lot of static pages, and, uh, and they said... We know that this is unmaintainable because there, there's one person who, who wrote all these VB scripts and he's just retired. And so we want to move to Drupal, but we want to do a lift and shift. You want to keep it exactly the same. And we looked at it and said, look, it's not responsive. It's, it's designed literally in the late 90s. We, we, cannot, uh, we cannot keep it as is. Uh, but there was a conflict where there was a lot of stakeholders who had strong opinions of, of what they wanted the new website to be. And that alone was going to be a multi-year project. But the guy retired. So, so that's, that's why this asked the lift and shift. And, and I had to explain that it's, it's, really, it's really not possible. What we can do, it'll be more expensive for us to design you a custom Drupal theme that happens to look exactly like the, the site on the left. So after, after some back and forth, we managed to, to build a consensus that for now, as quickly as possible, with a very minimal uh, stakeholder con consultation, we're going to take and adapt it to a generic, modern, responsive theme. Uh, that is very similar in components to the other projects that we're doing. So that is literally the cheapest option was to modernize that look and feel while, while not going into a big uh, content strategy 
uh, design audience research that uh, the John was talking about because there was no appetite to do that at that moment and then you just pressing. And uh, a couple of years later, they did go through that exercise. It took them a lot longer than they thought. It cost them a lot more money. But uh, the, new, the new site, which you can, you can see online today, was sadly not designed by us, but still looks great, and uh, is, is, is like this. So I think that was a, a successful example of, of how to do this in stages. Um, another example, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, does anyone else speak French here? Who, who speaks French? <laughs> Just, just the folks that drove up from Montreal and Ian. Awesome. Uh, so this Institut, Institut National Santé Publique is, um, is the Quebec equivalent of the CDC. So they're, they're in charge of all the communications for COVID uh, public health data. And, and they came to us with a similar ask. We have a Drupal 7 site. It's going to go to Drupal 9 or Drupal 10. Uh, we want to lift and shift. We want it to look exactly the same. Uh, and, and by the way, the budget's fixed. And at that point, I'm dealing with a large public sector organization with a fixed procurement process. I basically said, Evolving Web will, at its own expense, do an uh, accelerated design process and, and give you something that at least is responsive and looks a little bit more modern. But at the end of the day, we're happy enough to have it in our portfolio. And, and the, the citizens of Quebec uh, certainly appreciate uh, this thing. And, and, and there's still a mandate, and perhaps in the future, to continue to improve it. Um, and in fact, you know, the goodwill that we've, we've won by pushing for this, not from the initial stakeholders who define the initial project, but the greater stakeholders around them and maybe their bosses has, has led to a growth in their relationship. So we're, we're proud of that. Um, and and a third, a third uh, example is uh, McMaster University Faculty of Engineering. It's, it's one of the biggest and most important faculties. Uh, McMaster is, is one of the most important universities in Canada. It's, uh, it's in Hamilton, Ontario, about a, an hour, 45 minute drive from Toronto. And um, so this, this old site uh, was conformant to their brand. Unfortunately, their brand looks like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, have, I have to say, uh, we had the pleasure of, of, of a client who, who, on one hand, says we have to respect the communications team's brand. And on the other hand, we don't want to stick to the old brand because every website looks like this and we don't want to look like this. And, uh, and we're kind of stuck in the middle because we're like, yeah, we want to improve it, but yeah, we want to be usable and not confuse the audience members. And, like, you know, are you still on a McMaster site or is this a, a separate organization? And, and so we worked really hard with them and, and we kept a lot of the colors, uh, a lot of the same typography, but we introduced certain treatments that, that greatly evolved the brand. And, and we're hoping, although it's, it's, it was just launched a, a, a month ago or so, and we're hoping that this might become a template for, uh, for future sites, for, for the evolution of that brand. Um, and, and here we, 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 we did have that explicit mandate to evolve the brand, and, and so we're very proud of that. Um, so I mentioned these examples so that you're kind of on the same, on the same uh, wavelength to, to, to answer the question, well, to what extent do I do a, a revamp uh, lift and shift, lift and shift, a replatform, and I think um, the the answer is really it depends on the context. So you did the analysis of, and you started with why, and you, I hate viral stuff, so just like the quote, uh, you, you started with like who your audience is, and and you know what is the content that's worth keeping. You did your Google Analytics research, and you ran Screen Frog, and with all and with all of that, you have a sense. What is the complexity of this project? What are my organization's needs? What is the mandate that I have today? And then, specifically in the Drupal context, you should be asking, is this old site that I'm migrating or improving from, is it Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, 9, or 10? Because as, as most of you probably know, Drupal 7 has no up, direct upgrade path right, from, from future versions of Drupal, whereas starting Drupal 8, you can, you can iteratively just Revamp, is that what we're calling it? Yeah, like revamp, revamp it a little further, get the latest and greatest Drupal updates. So if it's a Drupal 7, that means it's a replatform. It's as if you're migrating from Cascade or Terminal 4 or whatever other CMS you can think of to, to Drupal. Uh, you're rebuilding everything brick by brick. You're writing automated and manual migrations. You're, you're going to be figuring out which pieces of content to keep or to remove. And, and at that point, you're forced to do some kind of redesign. But which kind of redesign depends on the organizational context and the mandate that you have and the stakeholders. Um, the other thing is, as I took a screenshot of, of one of our summaries of these technical audits, and, and we see how many lines of custom code, and how many contributed modules, and how many pages 
and in, in another screenshot you would have seen how many pages of each content type and, and how many fields does each one have. And, and, and so getting that complexity of, of the content that you're working with will help you understand uh, the constraints that you're under. And, and, and so it's taking all of those um, constraints into account, you can decide what's, what's the best course of action. And, and generally, while I'm, I'm definitely not an agile, dogmatic person, I think there's a lot of great ta takeaways from, from the lessons there. And so the agile methodology kind of suggests that you proceed in an iterative fashion, deploying often and showing value all the time. So I think that is, is, is safe for everyone to keep in mind. Make sure that whatever project you do does the most with the limited resources that you have, both money, staff time, availability of external resources or not, and and constantly uh, delivers value to the organizations, to the end users, to the employees, and, and achieves their business goals. And so that's, that's my advice to you, is, is to do the best job that you can with the constraints that you're under and, and always show, show the most value. So that's, that's my answer to revamp or redesign. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. So um, where does that leave us today? You know, you may say, well, where are you going? Um, and the answer is both. Um, <laughs> we're going to continue to revamp, as we've always done, to promote the scholarly research, to support and amplify our various program offerings and offices. But we're also going to look towards um, a redesign to better respond to these new branding guidelines and to embrace the technological advances that have happened in the past four years, uh, like Layout Builder and the Gen theme, et cetera. Um, so again, some uh, key takeaways to sort of wrap up today. Uh, just leave with data. Uh, it's your friend. Do a, a website audit. How does that translate to sort of your goals and objectives? Develop that content strategy, and then finally feel good to make an informed decision. Thank you so much. Any questions? I think we've got about five-ish minutes. Or, or stories. Stories, yeah. Uh, this question is for Alex. Um, when it comes to utilizing Screaming Frog and the crawls that you generate from that, um, are your devs doing that, or are, is another group or department doing that and kind of passing on a report and taking those learnings and kind of packaging them for the devs? Can you repeat the question for them? Um, thanks. Yeah, the question is, who, who is running Screaming Frog to get the reports? Is it the devs, or is it other members of, of the group and when, I guess? And uh, so I think we use it across the organization in a, in a number of different contexts. Um, first, for, for estimates, whenever we, as an agency, when somebody says, hey, we need a redesign or a revamp, you know, give us a quick quote, and we're just wondering, what is the size of the complexity? The first thing I do is I go to Google and type in site, spia.princeton.edu, enter, and, and roughly see, do they have 4,000 pages in PDFs or 40,000 pages of kind of page, pages in PDFs? And, and once we get beyond that initial small, medium, large sense, we'll run Screaming Frog just, just to get a sense of what kind of pages. Are they mostly uh, news articles and actually 90% of it are all templated and, and there's not that much complexity? Or are they 30 years of accumulated manually HTML crafted landing pages? Um, so we, we do it at that estimation level uh, with, with whatever team is involved in triaging projects. Uh, our content strategists will do it when they're going to do a full content audit. And, and, and I'm not sure how the devs use it, uh, so I think Jesse can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say, much like Alex said, and like I sort of showed earlier, it's about sort of using it to discover things that are hidden in there that we don't know about yet. Creating some filters, just sort of playing with what comes out of it, what the content is on the website, and, um, and how, how that all ends up, uh, uh, what that ends up uncovering in the overall architecture of the website. We'll usually, usually uncover lots of different content types that maybe aren't, or content types that aren't yet content types, but probably should be. Uh, we'll uncover some features that maybe you know were added to the site years ago that nobody really knows about anymore uh, when we're dealing with a you know really very very large site. Um, so and it's also as Alex said it's helpful for for estimating too to understand the, the complexities and, and everything on the site. So uh, it's it's a really good jumping off point to start exploring and discovering new things, and then how we use it after that is uh, is kind of you know we'll, we'll take it from there. 
Um, and I would say normally if, if I'm getting involved in like an estimate of a project, I'm probably running that first. I'll save that data for the rest of the team to use. Um, but if the content team is getting in there first, they'll save that data for the rest of us to use and look at and just kind of share between, between the, the different, different uh, teams on, within the company. Um, since you did your original launch of this new this new site, and you kind of come up against new requests and new goals that the department is trying to meet, how does your process work together with the agency, with Evolving Web, to say, here's a new problem that we have to deal with? What kind of solutions can we implement? Like, what kind of new you know block or or design element can we add? What kind of relationship do you have together to work through those things? Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's very much a consultative uh, partnership, um, and um, we really just. Question. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Repeat the question. Yeah. So uh, the question was: Since we launched uh, Spia, um, what are some of the ways that we work with Evolving Web to address those technical challenges, uh, differences, and and goals or, or asks from our various constituents, uh, whether that be a faculty, dean, etc. And really, for us, it's 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 doing those those audits and really referencing some of those goals and objectives that, that we've laid out from the beginning. Looking at those personas, um, sometimes uh, revising those per, per, per personas. How does that uh, then revise a goal or um, etc. And um, you know, with with evolving web, um, they they really help us more from a technical side um, in the, in this project. Um, so we really um, partner with them for more of the functionality and, and sort of figure out how, to, how this works in the back end. Um, yeah. I, I do want to add that we actually have a, a special relationship with, with SPIA compared to many of our other clients because of the technical uh, and strategic maturity of the team. Um, many of our clients end up buying like a monthly maintenance package and then here there wasn't really a need for that because because it's, uh, it's it's well taken care of internally, and uh, it kind of is a bit of a strain, right? Since if, if if there's not an ongoing commitment, how do we stay very active and and support them when from time to time they do need something? So to that end, I would just like to to thank John for his his tireless advocacy of of the work that we've done and and being our advocate within the Princeton community that, that led to lots lots of work. Uh, and so the fact that he invited us to, to co-present with him in, in this context is an example of that. And so we're able to really go much further than, than maybe the limit, limited number of hours that they need when they need specific things. So thank you for being such a, a great partner. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we're at time. One last one, one last one. So who has a story? <laughs> All right. Oh, over a beer tonight. Yeah. Yes, coffee, coffee. Yeah. Thank you. Now a, a word from our sponsors. Uh, <laughs> guys, Evolving Web is or helping organize a, a Drupal camp-like event called Evolve Drupal in Atlanta. It will happen on a Friday next, next month. We're expecting between 150 and 200 people. Uh, and we would love to, to invite y'all and your networks to, to come. The, the tickets are 50 bucks. And uh, it's really uh, a little bit different than camps in the sense that we have only two tracks. So it's a little bit more curated in terms of no, the number of talks. And we managed to balance them. Between a quarter of the talks are design systems and UX design and related case studies. A quarter of the talks are higher education type of stuff, like, like this talk here. A quarter are technical, DevOpsy, Drupal camp style talks, and a quarter is accessibility and all kind of digital best practices. So, so we hope to, to see some of you all there. Thanks. Thank you.